Praise the Lord. Let's rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless your name for bringing us to the conclusion of this retreat, this period. Thank you for all the ministers who have ministered to us. Thank you for the decisions we have made. Thank you for the prayers we have prayed. And thank you for the grace that has flowed into every life. Thank you, Lord, because of the strength and the power you have granted everyone so that we will serve you. We are asking, Lord, that all the changes, all the transformations you have made in every life will become permanent in Jesus' name. We ask, God, Lord, you help us to continue in the grace of God living righteously and godly in this present life so that lord you prepare us for the glory which is to come speak to everyone now lord in jesus name we pray we're looking at titus chapter 2 our reading from verse 11 titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You'll find in those verses where bread that there is a mention of the grace of God. There is a mention of living godly. That means living in godliness. There is also the mention of looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God. And our Savior Jesus Christ were called into the kingdom by grace, called into salvation by grace. And that grace that comes upon our lives is not just an initial deposit, it's an ongoing thing. And we find that in every situation, that grace of God is sufficient for us. Sufficient to do what? Sufficient to live as children of the king, as citizens of the kingdom, and as partakers of the grace that came through Calvary, grace, godliness. And all that the Lord is endeavoring to do in bringing us to the kingdom is to prepare us for the glory at the final time in Hebrews chapter 2 Hebrews chapter 2 we're looking at verse 9 but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, listen to this, in bringing many sons to glory. Grace, godliness, so that eventually he brings us to glory. He wants to bring many 
many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering second peter chapter 1 from verse 2 grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Already you see that these people that are receiving the epistle, they have been saved by grace. The apostle is now praying and desiring there will be a multiplication of that grace. A multiplication of that peace. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Because as you come into the kingdom, as you come into the life of the believer, you need the grace to continue. And every challenge you face, every opposition you face, you're going to find you need another level of grace in your life. And it gives us that grace in multiplied folds. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge as we read the word as we learn from the word as we understand the word as we believe the word as we apply the word and as we live by the word in obedience it says it is through the knowledge of god and of jesus christ then he goes on to say in verse 3 according as his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness we must never forget that that the grace of god comes into our lives so that we are brought into the life of godliness into the life of righteousness into the life that is upright a life that is loyal, a life that is faithful, a life that is obedient to the word we're learning. That if we learn of Christ the Savior, of Christ the Lord, of Christ the righteous, the grace of God comes into our lives so that the righteousness of Christ will be imparted and impacted in our lives. And we live in righteousness. We live in, in godliness. And then he goes on to say, It is still through the knowledge of him that has called us now to glory and to virtue. The grace, the godliness, and the glory whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having the grace of god we have the very nature of the lord himself so that by that same nature we'll be able to live the life a life of righteousness a life of obedience to the word a life that is different different from the life of the people in the world in short a life in godliness and it says the purpose he does that the reason he does that and the intention of the almighty god in doing that in our lives and bringing grace and bringing godliness is so that there will be virtue and there will be glory. Then he goes on to say that he has given us these exceedingly great promises. Precious promises. That by these he might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. By grace in godliness for his glory always keep that in your mind always ascertain in your mind and in your life 
that the grace of God has come in. Salvation has come in. But salvation is not just a coming in as if it will not affect your life. It affects your life. It affects your thoughts. It affects your behavior. It affects your character. It affects your conviction. It affects everything you do. It affects you in every area of your life, in all the places you go. By grace, that's how we're saved. In godliness, that's how we live. For glory, that's the goal. That's the intention. That's our theme, finally, on that wonderful and glorious day. Three things we're going to consider. Number one, souls saved by grace. Souls saved by grace. Any way of salvation other than the way of grace? No. Any possibility of salvation except by the grace of God? None. How can you be saved? How can you come into the kingdom? How can you say, yes, I praise the Lord. I am saved by grace through faith. Souls saved by grace. Number two, sons sanctified for godliness. Sons sanctified for godliness. The reason we are sanctified is so that the very life of God and likeness to God will be in our lives. So that when people see us, they don't see the flesh. They see the character of God. The Lord, by that sanctification, is bringing us back to his original intention. Let us make man in our image after our likeness so that the very nature and the very life of God will be in our lives. That's why he sanctifies us. He sanctifies us for godliness. Sons sanctified for godliness. Point number three, saints set apart for his glory. Saints Set apart for his glory. He sets us apart. He wants us to live in a way that glorifies the name of the Lord. The people that see us. The people that interact with us. The people that are influenced by us. They will know that everything we do, everywhere we go, Everywhere we act is for the glory of God. Let your light so shine before men that they, those who see you, those who know you, those who interact with you, those who are influenced by you, that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Saints set apart for his glory. Number one. Souls saved by grace. Saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It tells us what we had been. And now it tells us what we have become. For by grace are ye saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What's he saying by grace are ye saved? From verse 1 it talk, talks about what we were. And you are sick wicked. Who oh, are dead in trespasses. And sins dead in trespasses and sins because we are dead, we are deaf. 
Because we are dead, we are dumb. Because we are dead, we are blind. Blind to the light of Christ. Deaf to the voice of God. Dumb, not able to connect with God or speak to God. Wherein a time passed, you walk according to the course of this world. Our lifestyle before the grace of God came in was dictated by the curriculum of the world, the course of studies in the world, the patterns of the world, the principles of the world, the perversions of the world, the pollutions in the world. Wherein in time past, not now, in time past, before conversion, in time past, before meeting the Lord Jesus Christ, in time past, before the grace of God came in, ye walked, past tense, past tense, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Disobedient people are not just living by themselves. Some of them say, I like to do what I want to do. No, you're doing what the spirit of the world, the spirit of Satan, the spirit of the Antichrist, what he compels and propels you to do. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience, then it says, among whom also we all add, pastors, pastors, we all add a conversation. In times past, in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what, that was our past. But now, the grace of God came in. Now, the light of the gospel shone into our lives. And now, the power of the cross became effective in our lives. You see, when we meet Christ, the Christ who died on the cross, a transformation takes place. A change takes place. That's why it says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, as he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. He saves us, and he saves us by grace. But when he saves us by grace, he doesn't leave us like that. He wants us to continue in that grace, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, we're reading from verse 43. Acts 13, verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, that means when the service ended. That means when that meeting ended. And people now were free to go back to their homes. When the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them, persuaded them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The apostles convinced them, persuaded them, reminded them coming into the grace of God that brought salvation. Not to the same. Now you are born again. He says, that's not the end. And the grace is not only for the time of the meeting and for the time of the conference and for the time of the retreat. Now we continue in the grace of God. Continue in the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 
reading from verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. That ye receive not the grace of God in vain. That as the grace of God comes into your life, let's see the evidence. Let's see the manifestation. Let's see the outworking of that grace of God in your life. That ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now you see that's in parentheses. You see the marks of the bracket there. It's telling us in that bracket what has taken place already. What they heard before the grace of God, before the grace of God came in. And it says, you heard him. It was the accepted time. You called upon him and you were saved. Now it says, if you remove that bracket or if you just say, Read without reading that bracket. I'm going to do that now from verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you, plead with you. We're begging of you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain, giving no offense. You see that? You receive not the grace of God in vain. How do you demonstrate? How do you show? How do you reveal that you have not received the grace of God in vain, giving no offense in any sin? Giving no offense in any place. Giving no offense before anyone. Giving no offense in any situation. Giving no offense in anything. You've received the grace of God. And you are saved. You will not be an offense to the church of God. You will not be an offense to the brothers and sisters. You will not be an offense to the fellowship of believers. You will not be an offense in your office. You will not be an offense in your character. You will not be an offense in your comportment. You will not be an offense in your area. Because you want to show. That the grace of God has come into your life. And you are not an offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. What does that mean? That means that the ministry of preaching. That the ministry of the ministers. That the ministry in the fellowship. That the ministry in the church. Be not blamed. Make it general. That's our ministry. The whole ministry now. Deeper Christian life ministry. Be not blamed. That you have the grace of God in you. And the people of the world, they're looking at you. He is a member of the ministry. Now, receive not the grace of God in vain. Giving no offense your wife your wife doesn't come to the church you come to the church let her see that you have the grace of god in you giving no offense to your husband your husband does not come to the church or maybe he comes but it's not uh, he doesn't profess to be saved yet giving no offense to that husband that the husband will say uh-huh they talk about salvation i'm not saying but i'm even better than her giving no offense in anything that the ministry the whole ministry be not blame narrow it down the ministry what the ministry of the pastors what the ministry of the women 
What the ministry of young people? What the ministry of the singers? What the ministry of our ushers and security? What the ministry of those who help us do all this printing and publicizing and you know recording and sending forth this message all over the world that your area of ministry be not blamed that he is we comport ourselves in such a way that the grace of god is manifest and that grace anywhere you move you move with dignity and you move with righteousness and you move with uprightness and you move in holiness and righteousness and they'll say that what that's one of them you can tell by the way she talks by the way he behaves by the way he acts is all they're always like that so that the ministry will be appreciated other people will say when you want to get something serious when you want to prepare for heaven, go to that place because they are members. They show that they have not received the grace of God in vain. Look at that again. Verse 1, then verse 3. Omit the bracket. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Giving, of, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, whatever the situation, let the people see that the grace of God has come to your life and you have not received the grace of God in vain. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Souls saved by grace. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace makes us strong. Grace gives us spine. Grace gives us backbone. Grace gives us strength. Grace gives us conviction. Grace gives us boldness. Grace does not weaken us. Grace does not make us anemic. Grace does not make us impotent, powerless. Grace does not paralyze us. Grace quickens us, makes us strong, and makes us to have boldness and righteousness living according to the word of the Lord. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me. Among many witnesses, the same, don't subtract, the same, don't add, the same, you commit unto other people, faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. What's he saying? We have to be strong in grace before we can commit it to the hands of other people. Oh, because if we're not strong, no people don't, they don't just see strength by how we jump on the pulpit. How we run on the pulpit. They don't see strength, but how we shout on the pulpit. They see strength by how we conduct our lives. The winds will blow. The fire may burn. The persecution may come. 
opposition may arise. How do you know the people who are strong in the grace of God? The people that stand firm, stand erect, and stand bold. When those winds of adversity, when they begin to blow, the people who are strong in the grace of God, they keep standing. People don't see stress by how we command outsiders. You know, we come over here and we have, yes, we're believers, but we're outsiders in a way. Outsiders to the preacher. Because you are not members of his family. And then we come on here and we shout at the others outside. They say, hey, be strong in the grace of God in your home. If you are not strong enough to establish Christianity in your home, in your house, with your wife, with your children, you are not strong. You easily give up. Your wife is coming to the church. You are coming to the church. You are a teacher, a preacher in the church. We say it. You say it to the public. When you get back home, your wife says, this is what I'm going to do. You are not strong enough. You are not knowledgeable enough. You are not convincing enough. You are not effective enough to say, my wife, you are the dearest person to me. I think you should respect me more than the people outside there. If I teach and you cannot follow, then it means I'm a failure. It means you're not strong. The scene will start in your home and then we will know you are strong in the grace of God to emphasize and to put it right there that this is the way walk ye therein. Don't come and shout on me here if you cannot shout on your wife at home. Don't come and push me here if you cannot push your wife at home. Don't come and tell me about worldliness here if you cannot tell your wife at home about worldliness. If you are patching this and patching that, patching this and patching that, you are not strong. You know, it being strong, I'm not sure. It's not like, get out of that place, go and sit here. Uh-uh, hold on. Be strong at home. Be strong on the people or your children and let us see that you establish that standard of the word of God first with the people that are closest to you and then when you come here you don't have to shout when you come here they know you are strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ you see we must apply this to our lives. By grace, we're saved. You don't want to go to heaven alone. If you truly believe, if you truly believe that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If your wife, you know, is not holy. You know, there's fighting. You know, there is anger. And you know, there is whatever it is, love of the world and love of money that's why you start if you are strong you're not say because if i talk like this my wife will not give me that if i talk like this my wife will not do of course of course she will show her nature get ready and let the fire burn let the opposition come you want to show that my wife my dear i love you so much I don't love you for the food you are giving me. I don't love you for the pleasure you are giving me. I don't love you for this. That will be selfish. I love you enough for you to get to heaven. I can suffer. I will suffer for you to get to heaven. 
deny me of every sin and let me go through a little hell here so I can deliver you from the unquenchable fire of hell. That's being strong in the faith. Be strong in the faith, in the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus. And then after that, the things you have heard of me among many witnesses the same you'll be able to commit to others who shall be able to teach others also look at verse 3 thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ that's been strong in the grace of God when you're able to endure you teach a doctrine and you have opposition for that go back to the Bible did I teach error did I teach something erroneous? Did I mislead people? Check up. Take the time from Genesis to Revelation and see if, you are teach, if what you are teaching is right. If what you are teaching is right, after checking up and checking up and checking up, and then you have difficulty, you have resistance, and you have persecution, and you know that that is the word of God. Come back. Show that you are strong. In the grace of God, make a repetition of that doctrine. Make a repetition of that teaching. Teach that sin and let the people heat the fire seven times more. You need to be strong and endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries, entangles himself or the affairs of this life. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. That's what it takes. It's the grace. It's the grace. And he wants us to continue in that grace. He wants us to grow in that grace. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 18. But grow in grace. Grow in grace. Don't be static. Don't be at the same level. Grow in grace. What does that mean? You grow in endurance. And you grow in understanding. And you grow in firmness. And you grow in tenderness. And you grow in love. And you grow in wisdom. And you grow in everything that the grace of God puts upon our lives. But grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom to him be glory, both now and forever. And everybody said, and everybody said, Amen. Amen in your life. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 Looking diligently Lest any man fail of the grace of God You see that? There are people that tell us that Once you are in grace You are always in grace These people don't read their Bible Would you look up here for a moment? This will help us Writing our daily manner should be more specific more definite not superficial not mixed up with the doctrines of eternal security it's not just to nurse us it's not just to cushion us is to teach us day after day to get to heaven. Would you know that I receive sometimes questions? You know, they write because there are people that faithfully read the daily manner every day. They read the Bible and they read the daily manner, and then they write, they say, Sir, is this statement correct? In line with the revelation of the whole Bible. Is this not just telling us God is a sugar daddy over there. 
And he loves everything, loves everybody. This sin never rebukes us. This sin never corrects us. This sin never influences us in the right direction. It's, it's almost for them a waste of time. We need to be more definite and more specific. If we don't know the doctrines of the Bible, and if we don't know how to influence people to have conviction and to stand upright and to stand firm, let's quit and let's leave other people who can write and those who can tell us and move us forward, let them do the writing. It's not compulsory that you must be there, you must be there, you must be there. If we cannot write something that holds up the teaching of the whole Bible, the way deeper Christian life ministry presents it, is to support what we are doing. Look at this, it says in verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 28, wherefore we receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Let us have grace. We're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence. Tell me what follows there. Tell me out loud. And godly fear. That's New Testament. New Testament. Don't let us preach as if there's nothing to fear. Once you are saved, you are forever saved. No, not at all. Let there be a change. In fact, it follows by saying, For our God is a consuming fire. We're coming to point number two. Sons sanctified for godliness. Sons sanctified for godliness. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, reading from verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Sanctified by faith. Saved by grace through faith. Sanctified by faith in Christ. Christ was talking to Paul the apostle. So that me there refers to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. That's not sentimental. That's talking about the love of Christ. He rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. That was his love for Peter. He corrected Peter when he said something wrong. That's the love of Christ to Peter. Never correcting your wife is not love. Never putting things right. I don't want trouble. That's not love. That's selfishness. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's sanctification. It leads to godliness and holiness. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. 
For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. You know, when you are born again, the grace of God comes to your life. Not only that, the vision of eternity comes to your life. And now you move on. You are consecrated and you are sanctified. When that sanctification comes, it fills your heart with the love of God, the love for eternity. And all you want, you want this one to get saved, that one to get saved, and you want holiness. Your mind is filled up. With the things of God. Now, you understand, you cannot think of two things at the same time. If you are thinking of A and B comes, if the thought of A is very strong and occupies your mind and saturates your mind and fills your mind, the thought of B will be irrelevant it will not hold take any hold on you you are so strong and you are so filled and you are so saturated with the thought of a now when you are sanctified and christ is present in your life and christ is prominent in your life and christ is preeminent in your life and the goal of glory and the goal of getting to heaven is preeminent in your life. And holiness saturates your heart, saturates your thoughts. Temptations will come, all right. But the thought of that woman who is not your wife, the thought of that lady who is not your wife will not hold you will not have any meaning for you and will not have any impact or impression on you your heart is so filled filled with holiness that you see things as if you don't see them you go on the road as if you don't see all the mess on the road because the thought of a has so occupied your mind you're sanctified you're saturated you're filled but this thought of holiness, all the other things will not matter. And the people who say, I'm saved, I'm sanctified. My only problem is the ladies in this community, they're too much of pressure for me. And I, I can't hold myself when I see them. Check your salvation to start with. Don't tell me about sanctification. Check your salvation. When you are saved and you are sanctified, money, what's money? You see money like this, it doesn't hold any interest to you. The love of money, you know, you are counting in the counting room and then you say, when I saw the dollars, when I saw the pounds, when I saw the, you know, the euros, then the temptation came. And you're sanctified. And your heart is filled with glory and with heaven. You cannot hold those two thoughts at the same time. The love of money, the thought to even steal in the house of God. And you remember Ananias. And you remember Sapphira. And you remember Judas Iscariot. The thought to even steal. To even steal in your community, the thought of that. The thought of stealing in your office, the thought of that. And then you come to church, the thought of stealing in the church, never. That's, that's a backslider. Those people, they do not know the Lord. How can you be filled with sanctification and with church money at the same time? Not possible. How can you be filled with sanctification? Then you're messing up with your housemate. And then you're coming to church. Praise the Lord, I'm saved. Shut up. Don't say you're saved. Don't say you're going to heaven. Your mate knows 
that you are not a candidate for heaven. Why do you come to deceive yourself here? When we are sanctified, the grace of God comes in. And then godliness comes in. You will be godly. Somebody there said you will be godly. You see anybody there, they want to make a mess of their lives. They might even undress themselves. That's their business. We're not in the Old Testament. Well, David had no work doing and then walking like this and then saw somebody and he could not think of the whole kingdom. He could not think of the battles of the Lord. He could not think of what God had called him to do. He could not think of why he was chosen to replace Saul. And then he said, go get that woman for me. You're not in that situation today. Today, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto me. Somebody there has appeared unto you. Tell me out loud. Teaching me that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, I should live soberly and godly and righteously when i said where in this present world for this is the will of god even our sanctification that he should abstain from fornication look at verse 7 for god has not called us unto uncleanness but tell me Unto holiness, chapter 5. First Thessalonians, chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know where it starts? Appearance of evil. Sister, your headgear is not standing straight. Let me adjust it for you. Uh huh. That's your business. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Sister, you didn't remember to zip the back of your dress. Hold on. Wait. Let me do it for you. That's your job. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's how it starts. A little sin there, a little sin there, a little sin there, little drops of water, tell me the rest, make a mighty ocean. Your compromise here, your compromise there, your compromise there, your backslider. Abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you how i said how holy and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ faithful is he that calleth you also will do it. He'll do it in our lives. Second Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 21. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work flee also youthful lusts but follow righteousness faith charity peace of them that call on the lord out of a pure heart first timothy chapter six first timothy chapter six Reading from verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain 
we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Those who exalt money more than the experience of salvation. Those who pursue money more than pursuing heaven. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The Lord is calling us to sanctification and godliness sounds sanctified for godliness point number three saints set apart set apart set apart for godliness in isaiah chapter 43 isaiah chapter 43 reading from verse 7 isaiah Chapter 43, verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. You're saved for his glory. You're sanctified for his glory. You're set apart for his glory. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In Psalm 4, Psalm 4, the Psalms, the fourth Psalm, verse 3 and verse 4. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself know this the lord has set apart him that is godly for himself the lord will hear when i call unto him verse 4 stand in awe and sin not commune with your own heart Upon your bed and be still. You see that? He has set apart the people who are saved, the people who are sanctified, the people who have been called into the kingdom. He set them apart for himself so that they will bring him glory. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 9. But she a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I pray that purpose for which we were born again, the purpose for which we came into the kingdom, we will not forget. We'll keep on standing for the truth and keep on living for his glory, understanding 
that the singular purpose for which we came into the kingdom. Psalm 29. In Psalm 29, reading from verse 2. Psalm 29, reading from verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory. Due unto his name. That's how, that's why you came to the kingdom. That's what to concentrate on. That's what you occupy your thoughts, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your heart. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 96 verses 8 and 9. Psalm 96, verses 8 and 9. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and fear before him all the earth all the earth and as you have been born again you are the one to step out and show an example and demonstrate how the rest of the world around you will give the glory to god give the glory to god in character in conduct in behavior in lifestyle in meekness in gentleness in humility and in peace that you keep with other people. The life of Christ beaming out, shining forth, reflected through your life. That every time, the only thing that matters to you is that you give glory to God. Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, here we're reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine. And let your light so shine. You have become born again. The light now shall be shining. You have had contact with the light of the world. And you have got part of that light. And he lives inside you. Christ the light. Shining forth through you. Let your light shine. Go beyond that. Let your light so shine. Let the character of Christ. Christ the light. Let it so shine. Let your light so shine. Before men. If they provoke you and you are angry. That's not the light of Christ shining. If somebody wants to start a fight, he starts fighting, and you start fighting, the light is not shining. If somebody at home said, How are we going to buy this? How are we going to buy this? And then we don't have any money, and then you come to the church and you think you see cheap money to steal, and you steal. That's not your light shining. You can't endure hunger. You can't say, if I die of hunger, I die of hunger, I will never steal. Let your light so shine before men that they will see that this brother, this sister, she is living according to the life of Christ and the light of Christ. And in whatever situation and at whatever time, the light is shining and is so shining before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As we're going back home, our light will shine. The glory of Christ will be reflected in Jesus' name. And our preachers, our preachers, our preachers, let your light so shine. The light of knowledge. The light of conviction. Let it so shine. If you're preaching in your local place and you say, 
this is what the pastor says but here this is what we say the people can tell you don't have any backbone the people can tell there's no light of faithfulness the people can tell that because there is failure in the corner of your house you cannot rise up for the light to shine they can tell we're adults but when you have this light the word of god anywhere you are anywhere you stand let this light shine the light of the teaching of the word of God and the light of the doctrine of the word of God. Let it so shine that the people who see you, they will know you came from a place where the fire was burning and the fire is burning in your soul. Somebody there said the fire is burning in your soul. It will burn in Jesus' name. Excuse me. Ministry is sacred. Do you remember Aaron and Miriam? They spoke against Moses. And God came down and he rebuked both of them. And then something came on Miriam. What's that? Tell me if you know the Bible. Out there, tell me if you know the Bible. Miriam, leprosy came on her. The point I want to make is this. Miriam was to be taken out of the camp and to be made to stay outside until that leprosy will depart from her. Number one. They didn't say, because Miriam is a senior sister of Aaron and Moses, the law of God that said the leper should be outside the camp, we can't operate that now because of Miriam. No. The word of God was the word of God. But the next point is this. It was the high priest that had the responsibility of taking the leper outside and keeping the leper outside. And the high priest, who was the high priest? I said, who was the high priest? Aaron. And they gossiped together. They said that thing together. We don't know who engineered it, who originated it. Leprosy came on Miriam. And now Aaron cannot say, I'm not qualified to do my duty. I'm not qualified to take Miriam and take her outside. Nobody else will do it. Aaron, you're the high priest. Now have a backbone. Now have the stamina. And do your duty. And he had to do it. Maybe some of these things you have been guilty about it in the past yourself. But now you come. And here is the word of God. And this has to be done. And you are still there. And you have not been removed. And you are still the Aaron there. For the glory of God. For upholding the truth and righteousness. And lifting up, pushing up the banner of our captain you will do what is right in jesus name john chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 35 he was a burning and a shining light he was a burning and a shining light you're living this retreat as a burning light as a shining light and your light was so shine that the men and the women that see you they will glorify our god our father who is in heaven revelation chapter 4 verse 11. revelation chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 11 thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor 
and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were, they are, and were created. You are created to honor him, created to glorify him, created to lift up the banner of righteousness. You are created, you are saved, you are redeemed, and you are saved and sanctified to bring glory to God. And as you do that, one of these days, the trumpet will sound, and then the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive. My brother, you'll be there. My sister there, you'll be there. You know, that's the reason we're preaching. That's the reason we're singing. That's the reason we're walking. That's the reason we're ministering. That everyone here, everyone here, am I talking to somebody there today? Everyone there, am I talking to a brother there today? Am I talking to a sister there today? Everybody there will wash our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And when the trumpet shall sound, praise the Lord, I know I will see you there. I said, I know I will see you there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I will be there. I will be there. I will be there. I will be there. You tell the Lord, saved by his grace, sanctified for godliness, set apart. For his glory. Open your mouth and pray. And let the Lord know that you really want to get to that glorious city. To that heaven. That you want at that final day to be counted among the number. We're asking our state overseers. Our region overseers. And the people who are leading in those various retreat locations. Take over right now. And lead our people into this salvation by grace. And into this sanctification for godliness. And into separation. Be set apart for the glory of God. Let lead the people to pray. And let us all be ready. For the time when the Lord will come. Over here we invite our own. Um, a camp commandant to come and lead us in prayer and help us to see that this is what we are laboring for and this is what we are preaching for and this is what we are gathering together for that the Lord will bring the grace of God in your life that the Lord himself will bring that sanctification for godliness that the Lord will set you apart set you apart set you apart for his glory camp commandant please come